this video, I'm gonna go over Carl Jung's childhood trauma. And I'm actually gonna share with you a few different things that you may not have known about Jung as a child. Uh, one of those things is I'm gonna share Carl Jung's first dream, the first dream that he's ever had. And actually, I bet you, if you've never read Memories, Dreams, and Reflections before, that you will not be able to guess the dream that Jung had. Um, it actually caught me by surprise. And so it was quite bizarre. It took me off guard when I first read it. Uh, however, I'm gonna share it in its complete form in this video. So make sure you stick around for that. I'm also gonna share with you Jung's secret ritual that he did as a child and he kept it secret. He didn't tell anyone that he did this. So definitely stick around for that as well. So if you haven't read Memories, Dreams and Reflections, which is Carl Jung's autobiography, well, he actually had help writing it because he was quite old when he began the project. So one of his assistants actually helped him to write Memories, Dreams and Reflections. So it's not quite an autobiography, uh, even though it, Jung did approve the final product and he did make heavy contributions to the book, which it says in the introduction of the book. Uh, but if you haven't read Memories, Dreams and Reflections, or if you have read Memories, Dreams and Reflections, but you'd like a copy, there's a link in the description. Uh, it's an affiliate link, so if you do purchase the book through that link, it does help this channel. I've also set up a Patreon down there. Uh, there's a link down there. If you would like to donate, even a dollar a month would help me out very much. So thank you for that. And it is an interesting book. It's one of those classics that you kind of just want on your shelf to read. I know I like having a physical copy. Uh, I might even buy the other version. There's different versions. They don't always look like this. Um, they've got different covers. Um, but this is an old one that I kind of picked up secondhand. So I'd, I think I'd like a fresh one as well because this one smells a little bit while I'm reading it. So Jung was born in 1875 and when he was six months old, he moved from Keswell, which is on Lake Constance, to Lawfen, where his father had a job there. And it actually is such a beautiful place. It has a castle, a viscerage above the falls of Rhine. And Jung said that he remembers the viscerage, the garden, the laundry house, the church, the castle, the falls, the small castle of Worth, and the Sexton's farm. So he remembers lots of different little images there as a child. And so he lived in this location, such a beautiful location, kind of reminds you of some type of fantasy fiction novel or something like that. It absolutely looks so beautiful. Um, so he, he was here from around six months old to about four years old or something like that. And uh, one memory that he has um, was basically when he was young was he was in a pram and he was under this tree this shady tree and he just remembers the the pram hood was kind of lifted up a little bit and he just remembered looking out and seeing the vibrant colors everywhere and he just felt absolutely full of the highest form of well-being he just felt so ecstatic and happy that's one of his earliest memories that he ever had. And when Jung was a child, he was a fairly strange child. Uh, one instance he recalls is that he remembers that some people nearby found a body of a person who had drowned in the lake nearby. And so he wanted to see that body straight away. He was only like four years old. But what happened was is his mum wouldn't let him go. And so they put the body in this little kind of place and Jung later stuck out and went to find and look at the body, but he couldn't open the door cause it was locked, but he ran around the back and he saw coming out of the drainage, there was some blood leaking down out of the place. And so he, he recalls remembering that. And then when he was a bit older, he says another memory that he has of hearing about different people who had drowned and he went to go see the bodies because he wanted to see the dead bodies. And the body he found was a middle-aged man with kind of his hand over his eyes. 
uh, and sand over half his body. So Jung was very interested in kind of weird things when he was a kid, um, but that's okay, you know, it's kind of, he has his own unique experience. One of the unique experiences that Jung had, and this links actually into Jung's trauma that he had, is he, he remembers seeing this kind of person uh, dressed in this black kind of gown, and he was very scared of this person and thought, oh my God, he, he thought to himself straight away, this must be a Jesuit. And so, because he, he heard his father talking with a friend earlier uh, in this kind of angry, irritated, but at the same time fearful way about Jesuits. So, he, you know, and so he, he saw this figure in walking around with this big robe and thought, oh, that must be a Jesuit. And, you know, he linked that in his mind for some reason. And he was kind of scared of that that person because it looked like they were wearing women's clothing. Uh, but later on, he realized that it was just a harmless Catholic priest. So nothing really, you know, was coming to get him or anything. It's just, he just associated these things in his mind. And that association becomes important because it kind of sticks with him. And he didn't really know what a Jesuit was, um, but he knew what Jesus was because he heard Lord Jesus all the time and like I said a lot of people were kind of getting hurt or drowning and different people he knew in the community would go missing all of a sudden and he'd hear people say oh Lord Jesus has taken this person away you know and he he would think to himself Lord Jesus seems like a pretty evil you know, person, <laughs> because he, he seems to be taking these people away. And he was associating Lord Jesus with people being taken away, with people being put into a dugout hole, people being put into a grave. He was associating Lord Jesus with that. And Jung's mother actually gave him this little poem to read out about Lord Jesus. And the poem goes like this, spread out thy wings, Lord Jesus mild and take thee thy chick, thy child. If Satan would devour it, no harm shall overpower it. So let the angels sing. And what was funny about that poem, Jung kind of thought about that poem and deconstructed it in his mind. He thought, okay, well, Lord Jesus, uh, is kind of seems reluctant. So we have to ask Lord Jesus to come. So he's kind of reluctant to eat the chicks and the chicks are meant to be the children. But he kind of reasoned that Satan was not reluctant at all. Satan just wanted to eat these chicks. Um, but Lord Jesus reluctantly ate the chicks so Satan couldn't eat the chicks. And so he kind of reasoned in this funny little way as a child. Remember, he was only probably about four years old or something like that. And so he he just kind of rationalized it away by saying, okay. And he says he tried consciously throughout his childhood to really believe in Lord Jesus, but he kind of always had this doubt about it because he, he had all these negative associations with the Jesuit he saw what he thought was a Jesuit, which was just a Catholic priest in a black robe, with these people who were always carrying these black coffins. They were wearing black boots and they were carrying these black coffins, putting people into a hole, into a grave with all the black dirt. Those negative associations were paired with people saying that Lord Jesus has taken this person. And so Jung kind of kept these associations and it really kind of traumatized him in, in a certain way. And he didn't know how to kind of deal with them within, within himself. Now, throughout this time, Jung also experienced a kind of lot of family issues. So his mother and his father didn't always get along. And when they were in Lawfen in particular, because his father had a job there, uh, the mother was quite irritable, Jung, Jung explains, and that she was really kind of becoming mentally ill in, in a sense. She didn't like it there. And 
uh, Jung just describes them as sleeping in separate rooms and he kind of had these, you know, um, traumatic experiences where he felt like at night time that there was kind of things in the house. He felt scared like it was dark and there was noises and things rustling around the, in the house. And one time he saw near his mother's room this kind of, um, I guess you'd call it, it looked like this figure. And this figure kind of had a head and the head would pop off and then float in front of um, the person and it looked like a little moon floating and then another head would grow and then pop off and float in front of it. So he had these kind of weird, you know, things that he saw. And so he saw that and he also had another time where he saw this kind of, I don't know, this glowing orb above him or something like that. And he thought there was little angels inside it or something. So, you know, he was kind of traumatized and had these kind of traumatic visions, I guess you would say, as a child. And his mum actually got ill uh, and went to the hospital for a while. And so when that was happening, Jung was put um, with his auntie, which was his mother's sister. And he describes his mother's sister as having kind of um, dark hair with a kind of uh, olive complexion. And he said that he felt like she was a very different type of motherly figure, but that his memories of her kind of became part of his conception of his anima, which, you know, if you know about Carl Jung, anima is the feminine aspect of the male. And so he described that his aunt, uh, parts of her kind of, manifested in his conception and relation to the anima, which is that particular archetype. Jung also said he kind of developed this pseudo illness where he would choke up all the time. And he explained that it was due to the fighting and the, the kind of the breakdown within his family, with his father and his mother. He kind of explained it as he couldn't breathe in that atmosphere and psychologically it was impacting him and he associates the, the physical symptoms with that psychological trauma that he had. And Jung said, and I quote, I was deeply troubled by my mother's being away. From then on, I always felt mistrustful when the word love was spoken. The feeling I associated with woman was for a long time that of innate unreliability. Father, on the other hand, meant reliability and powerlessness. That is the handicap I started off with." Close quote. So Jung then goes on to explain how he kind of overcame this handicap because he had many experiences where a male would let him down and he'd be disappointed. And when a woman, he'd feel distrustful, but then he would see that they actually would follow through and they could be reliable. So he kind of said he developed out of that kind of trauma that he experienced as a child. And so Jung said, and I quote, these ruminations of mine led to my first conscious trauma, close quote. So basically when he said that, he's referring to the negative association of the Lord Jesus because he associated it now with what I was saying with the coffins, the black coffins, the boxes, and the black men kind of walking with their black boots and, you know, putting people into a hole. And he, he associated that negative kind of thing with Lord Jesus. And obviously all the things going on with his family also impacted him at that time. So, Let's move on now to Jung's first dream. So I'm going to read a bit of it just so we can kind of get exactly what the dream was. So here we go. Open quote. I had the earliest dream I can remember, a dream which was to preoccupy me all my life. I was then between three and four years old. The viscerage stood quite alone 
near Lawfen Castle, and there was a big meadow stretching back from the sexton's farm. In the dream, I was in this meadow. Suddenly, I discovered a dark, rectangular, stone-lined hole in the ground. I had never seen it before. I ran forward curiously and peered down into it. Then I saw a stone stairway leading down. Hesitantly and fearfully, I descended. At the bottom was a doorway with a round arc, closed off by a green curtain. It was a big, heavy curtain of worked stuff like brocade, and it looked very sumptuous. Curious to see what might be beh hidden behind, I pushed it aside. I saw before me, in the dim light, a rectangular chamber about 30 feet long. The ceiling was arced and of hewn stone. The floor was laid with flagstone, and in the center a red carpet ran from the entrance to a low platform. On this platform stood a wonderfully rich golden throne. I am not certain, but perhaps a red cushion lay on the seat. It was a magnificent throne, a real king's throne in a fairy tale. Something was standing on it, which I thought at first was a tree trunk, 12 to 15 feet high and about one and a half to two feet thick. It was a huge thing, reaching almost to the ceiling, but it was of a curious composition. It was made of skin and naked flesh, and on top there was something like a round head with no face and no hair. On the very top of the head was a single eye, gazing motionlessly upwards. It was fairly light in the room, although there were no windows and no apparent source of light. Above the head, however, was an aura of brightness. The thing did not move, yet I had the feeling that it might at any moment crawl off the throne like a worm and creep towards me. I was paralyzed with terror. At that moment, I heard from outside and above me my mother's voice. She called out, Yes, just look at him. That is the man-eater. That intensified my terror still more, and I awoke sweating and scared to death. For many nights afterwards, I was afraid to go to sleep because I feared I might have another dream like that. This dream haunted me for years. Only much later did I realize that what I had seen was a phallus, and it was decades before I understood that it was a ritual phallus. I could never make out whether my mother meant that is the man-eater or that is the man-eater. In the first, she would have meant that not Lord Jesus or the Jesuit was the devourer of little children, but the phallus. In the second case, that the man-eater in general was symbolized by the phallus, so that the dark Lord Jesus, the Jesuit, and the phallus were identical. Close quote. So you see here, Jung kind of has this uh, trauma, and it's playing out in his dreams as well. And he's linked this kind of trauma that he said with the Jesuit and Lord Jesus with this dream of the man-eater, which is this phallus, which is a, a, a penis on a throne. And he didn't realize at first, but later in his life, he obviously, when he's researching ancient cultures, he realized, well, they, they worshipped phalluses, you know, and that there was a certain ritual around these phalluses. And so uh, that is the absurd kind of dream that Jung had as a child. Now, one might think at first, what, what happened to Jung as a child? Because, you know, there's Catholic priests, there's all these weird things, he has this trauma around it all. So I'm not really sure what exactly happened, but it, 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 it seems like maybe he could have been sexually abused. I don't know, what do you think? So what do you guys think about Jung's first dream? Leave a comment for me letting me know what you think. Is it possible uh, that he could have been sexually abused as a child? You know, I think from reading this dream, 
it is possible, maybe, but it's not quite clear, so we can't say that that's definitely what happened. Um, it could just be all the traumatic things going on in his life as a child. So let's move on now to Jung's secret ritual. Um, but before I get into that, actually, which plays into this ritual, he tells, Jung says that he, when he was younger, he used to go and sit on top of this stone, this nice smooth stone. And he used to always think to himself, uh, you know, I'm sitting on this stone, but from the stone's perspective, the stone is sitting on me. And then after he would think about this thought experiment, he would be kind of muddled up and confused and be like, who am I and who is the stone? And, you know, he would love thinking about these things. It's kind of this little thought experiment that Jung would do. And he would do that for quite a long time. It's not like he just did this once. He would do this kind of quite often to help him feel secure with himself. Because he said that he, he was feeling kind of split in two. He could feel that he was being split in two when he started to go to school because he was acting a little bit differently because he realized that he was acting like the people were acting in school. And he, he could sense that he was kind of had this fragmentation in himself. And with all the uncertainties happening in life uh, at home and within the world, he felt the world was pretty harsh and, and, and kind of he, he felt like, yeah, it was, it was quite a harsh world out there. There's this quote uh, that he says, and I'll read it out for you. He said, the influence of this wider world, this world which contained others besides my parents, seemed to me dubious, if not altogether suspect, and in some obscure way, hostile, close quote. So you see, he was kind of, you know, felt like the outside world was hostile to him. And uh, basically, yeah, he, he kind of loved to do these things alone a lot of the time. When he was lighting a fire, he used to light fires as well. And he didn't care about other people's fires or other kids' fires. He only cared about his fire. And he only cared about his stone that he sat on. He was, he was very much, you know, he was an only child up until around age nine when his parents had his sister. So for, for a long time, he kind of grew up alone and, until he went to school. He did enjoy playing with others, though. He did enjoy it, but he felt that split in himself, as I explained earlier. And moving on to Jung's secret ritual. So when he started going to school, he obviously had this pencil case, and he had this customary ruler. Everyone has a ruler when they go to school. And what he did is he carved this little mannequin this little image on the end of the ruler and he cut it off and he gave it a little coat and he basically he hid this little mannequin in his attic it, it, it was forbidden for him to go to the attic because i don't know like the wood was rot, rotten out or eaten by worms or something like that so it was probably dangerous to go up there but he'd go up there and he would hide this little mannequin when no one was around. And he had this little oblong, um, which is kind of like an oval shape, uh, stone, a smooth stone. And half of it was colored, I believe, and was distinct from the other half of the stone. And he would put that stone up there with the little mannequin man and his little coat. And what he would do is he would um, have that there as his secret little place, I guess, his little secret that no one really knew about. And he would, over time, he said, write little passages, little scrolls and bring them to the mannequin. And they were like his little library, the mannequin's little library of scrolls that he would have. And so he kept this kind of little secret in himself and every, every time something happened with his family or he felt anxious about something, he would think of this little secret mannequin and it would give him kind of rest. He would feel good again. He, he would feel like his mental kind of trauma has gone away. And it's, kind of, it's pretty strange, you know. And so if you've seen my other video on Jung's therapies for depression, which I'll link up here in this 
in this video, you can click that. I actually describe how Jung's methods, when he's obviously when he's much older and he's doing his scientific work, he describes how to go through certain therapies to relieve um, depression, and this includes trauma in a sense because what Jung has done is he has um, acted out the therapy he explicitly teaches later on in life, which is to, uh, you know, using some form of art or something is to physically make a representation of the trauma you have. Now that mannequin uh, resembled the those kind of dark men who had the dark boots on with the coffin. And so he kind of personified, he, he made into physical reality a, a shape or picture of the trauma he had as a child. And um, that's why when he thought about that little secret of this little mannequin, it gave him so much peace. And later on, when he's 35 years old, when he's doing his preliminary studies for his book called Symbols of Transformation. Back then, it was, uh, I believe, called um, The Psychology of the Unconscious. That's what it originally was in 1916. Then it got uh, retitled to Symbols of Transformation in 1955. And so I'll just read this quote here from Jung because I believe that it really... Um, will give you some insight into what was happening with him in regards to this secret ritual he was doing. Open quote, The episode with the carved mannequin formed the climax and the conclusion of my childhood. It lasted about a year. Thereafter, I completely forgot the whole affair until I was 35. Then this fragment of memory rose up again from the mists of childhood with pristine clarity while I was engaged on the preliminary studies of my book, close quote. Open quote. I read about the cache of soul stones near Ara Lashim and the Australian Chiringas. I suddenly discovered that I had a quite definite image of such a stone, though I had never seen any reproductions. It was oblong, blackish, and painted into an upper and lower half. This image was joined by that of the pencil box and the mannequin. The mannequin was a little cloaked god of the ancient world, a Teleforus, such as stands on the mountains of Aklepios, and reads to him from a scroll. Along with this recollection, there came to me for the first time the conviction that there are archaic psychic components which have entered the individual psyche without any direct line of tradition. Close quote. So, there you have it. There is, as he was older, he kind of, and was researching these things, he discovered all these different ancient rituals that were linked to his, you know, manifestation, his, his kind of outward physical behavior, acting out this ritual as a child, and he didn't even know it. And he says later that he realized that he was acting out the same rituals that kind of African tribes acted out, and they didn't really know what they're doing. They kind of act things out like a drama, you know, dramatization of something. And then only later do they reflect and realize what they were acting out and what they were actually doing. So it's first comes in behavior, and second, through the reflection of what that behavior means. And so Jung was actually acting out these rituals. And it, it was kind of a really bizarre thing to, to hear this. Um, because at first you think, wow, that's weird. You know what I mean? And, but if Jung's idea of the collective unconscious is true, right? Which we will continue to research it, look into it, because... Uh, I want to get Jung's perspective of what it is before I start criticizing it. And that's really what I want to do because I don't like when people criticize things without understanding it fully first. And so I still am in progress learning things and I don't claim to know everything. But if this is true, then this is pretty amazing that um, 
he can actually act out these rituals and and then years later when he's studying these things deep in the weeds of ancient you know mythology and different religions and comparative religion that then he realizes wow these are the same things like this this stone that he had that he made for his little mannequin he he says that um he gave that stone is like the life force of the mannequin or something like that and um he he basically later in his life remade that mannequin but in a bigger piece of stone when he was older and he called it atmavictu atmavictu something like that right and it means the breath of life and he said that that oblong black stone was the supply of life force for the mannequin and it and but he links this mannequin to um that trauma that coffin when he when he saw those coffins and the people with black boots putting people into the ground so he's linking all these things together and um yeah it it, it is quite bizarre but at the same time um quite powerful it it seemed to have helped him psychologically so he that this is what helped him the physical you know um expression the physical expression of this mannequin helped him emotionally through this process to get over this trauma and when he was much older like i said he reproduced it the mannequin and that again gave him a new way of seeing things and he said it was the manifestation of the creative impulse now what does that mean i mean um i'm not fully sure what that means but i guess it's some type of life essence that helps him um with with his life's work that he's created and so yeah let me know what you guys think about jung's secret ritual so thanks for watching guys i actually created this video months and months ago but my camera broke just as i was about to do the outro of the video so uh, here I am, I've got my new camera and this channel is back in action. Uh, I would like to ask you if you would like to donate via Patreon, I've got a link in the description. Um, that will help me to continue these videos. Hopefully if my camera breaks again, I'll have the funds to continue. Uh, so, but I do plan to pump out a lot more content. Uh, so I've got I'm gonna to continue to go through memories, dreams, and reflections with Jung. I'm gonna do some Freud with the interpretation of dreams. And we're gonna get into some of the Greeks. This is the Trojan War, the history of the Trojan War. And the Greek mythology. We're gonna go through some of that uh, because I think it's important to understand the Greeks. It's important to understand Freud as well as Jung. And um, I've got a little bit of Hypnosis. I've never really read much about hypnosis, so we're going to get into that as well. And I'm going to get into uh, some popular psychology. This is Blink from Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, some quite interesting insights there. And also I've got personal development series I'm going to release. This is the book Think and Grow Rich. It's obviously a very well-known book. But I think I'm going to be able to illuminate some principles in this book in a new way, especially considering uh, my understanding of Jung. So it's obviously different to that, but I'm going to analyze it probably in a, a way that I've never seen before, at least on YouTube anyway. So thanks for watching, guys. I appreciate you. And new videos are coming out now.